The information contained in this educational video describes a research study recently approved by the FDA and currently being conducted at the University of Washington in Seattle, Washington. The information provided about this research is based on experience with dozens of subjects enrolled in the research study to date. The Physician Modified Endograft, or PMEG, study is being conducted for research and is not considered clinical care at this time. PMEG therapy is still investigational and is being used in research. Physicians interested in referring eligible subjects to the PMEG study at the University of Washington should indicate to their potential patients that PMEG therapy is investigational at this time. Dr. Benjamin Starnes at the University of Washington was given FDA approval to enroll up to 150 subjects in the PMEG research study. Based on his research experience, it is hoped that PMEG may become recognized as a safe and effective alternative to other therapies. My name is Ben Starnes, and I am Professor and Chief of Vascular Surgery at the University of Washington in Seattle. When I came to Harborview in 2007, I was met with more ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms than I had ever seen before in my life. In fact, Harborview Medical Center in Seattle, a subsidiary of UW Medicine, uh, treats more ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms than any hospital in the country, between 30 and 40 ruptured aneurysms a year. We were successful in implementing a program to, to manage these patients or a protocol to manage these patients using a, an endovascular first strategy. That is a minimally invasive approach at managing these patients. For the first time in three decades, we were able to cut the mortality rate in half for all patients coming in with ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms. And for those patients lucky enough to receive EVAR, the mortality rate was only 18%. So the majority of these patients undergoing EVAR were able to survive their hospital admission. Then came the question, what to do about patients that come in with a ruptured aneurysms who are anatomically unsuitable for an endovascular aneurysm repair? We needed an off-the-shelf solution for managing these terribly difficult patients who were still experiencing a 50% mortality or greater. Therefore, we came up with PMEG. PMEG stands for Physician Modified Endovascular Grafts. And it simply revolves around the concept of taking a commercially available graft and customizing it to fit the patient so that those patients can realize the same survival benefit as those patients who are good candidates for a standard EVAR. So if we look at a Kaplan-Meier survival curve over 30 days for patients presenting with ruptured AAA, where on the y-axis we have percent survival and on the x-axis we have time, what we found is that before we implemented this protocol, our survival curve looked something like this, where there was a sharp decline initially in survival over the first few days, and then that extended out to about a 50% survival rate after 30 days. When we looked at our post-protocol patients, for those who underwent open repair, had similar rates of survival. But for the patients undergoing endovascular repair, there was a significant survival benefit where only 18% of those patients expired in 30 days. The question then became, how do we take these patients who are forced to undergo open repair because of anatomic limitations and have them realize the same survival benefit as the patients who were fortunate enough to undergo EVAR? So in 2011, we sought for and won approval from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, an investigational device exemption for the management of these patients presenting with asymptomatic, symptomatic, or ruptured juxtarenal abdominal aortic aneurysms. Let me show you the device. This is uh, what the device looks like. We use a Cook standard bifurcated infrarenal graft, and the graft is uh, unsheathed on the back table during the surgical procedure under sterile conditions and create custom fenestrations for each individual patient. We do that based on specific measurements that are gained from very highly developed software. Uh, fenestrations are then burned into the fabric and a gold marker is sewn around the edges of that fenestration to make it radio opaque 
for better visualization during the fluoroscopic procedure. So it's important in these cases to have precise imaging and to have a planning strategy. I'm gonna show you now our video wall. What you'll realize is that 90 to 95% of these cases are done outside of the operating room in the planning stage. It's quite important to have very high powered software to uh, look at different angles and different length measurements, diameter measurements, arc lengths, etc. So this video wall is important in several different ways. It's a, a very powerful teaching tool as well as a planning tool. Uh, what I can show you is that this um, technology allows us to link directly with the operating room during these cases that we do and it also allows us to pull up images and look at them directly in the operating room while we're doing the procedure. As we all know, this is standard aortic anatomy for a garden variety aneurysm where we have at least 15 millimeters of neck and we're able to get seal with a standard endograft up to the level of those renal arteries. When we look at a patient that has a juxtarenal aneurysm, like the aneurysm in our patient, there is no neck and only about two to four millimeters of neck below the renal arteries. So we therefore have to create holes for those branch vessels and be able to extend the graft up to cover those vessels. The way we do that is we take the stent graft, we unsheath it, we cut a hole for the SMA, a hole for each of the renal arteries, sew a gold marker around those fenestrations and then put that graft into position with the fenestrations lined up like so. We then go out and stent into those renal arteries. So when we look at the axial image here, we have these branch vessels like so. And let's say that this is the SMA and this is the left renal. We want to know what this arc length is from here to here. So arc length equals the diameter of this vessel times pi times the angle between these two vessels divided by 360. And that gives us an arc length of about 15 to 20 millimeters on average. So the case that I'm going to present to you today is of an 83-year-old female who had an asymptomatic juxtarenal abdominal aortic aneurysm diagnosed by a very astute clinician, her primary care provider, on physical examination. We all know that that's not the typical route for diagnosis of these aneurysms as they're usually discovered on a study that's done for some other reason. She was referred to me because of her age and some other comorbidities and she was not a candidate for open surgical repair. Your aneurysm encroaches uh, right up to the level of arteries that feed your kidneys. After a lengthy discussion, we elected to proceed with physician-modified endovascular grafting for this juxtarenal aortic aneurysm. See that artery? Mm -hmm. That artery feeds your entire left kidney and it comes off right above this aneurysm. I'm happy to say that for this six centimeter aneurysm, uh, this subject had a one-year follow-up CT scan that showed complete uh, resolution of the, uh, of the aneurysm with a, a size of only 3.4 centimeters without any evidence of endoleak and with branch vessel patency in all of her fenestrated vessels. And you can see that your aneurysm swings way out here and then comes back down toward your, toward your belly button. Another very important use for our video wall is 
the fact that we're able to bring in each of our subjects into the conference room and show them on the video wall their anatomy, show them how we manipulate their images and help them understand their disease process, their aneurysm, and the subsequent methods for repair. Fantastic. Pretty interesting, huh? It is, very. <laughs> Overall, endovascular repair of abdominal aortic aneurysmal disease has resulted in a dramatic decrease in mortality rates. When we look at the Medicare database, a study of over 60,000 patients showed that there was a four times higher rate of death in patients undergoing a traditional open repair compared with endovascular repair. There was a seven times like, uh, higher likelihood of undergoing a tracheostomy associated with open repair compared with endovascular repair, and a 12-fold increase in the risk of developing a bowel obstruction due to uh, scar tissue from the laparotomy itself. So this is a commercially available bifurcated stent graft that is currently sterile in its uh, current form. And we're going to unsheath the device and actually deploy it so that we can create fenestrations in the graft and then resheath the device so that it can be implanted into a patient. So now what we have here is the graft that has been deployed. We then go ahead and make our measurements after lining this up and noticing the proper orientation of the graft. And we try and create our fenestrations where there are no metallic struts impeding the flow of blood into the branch vessels. When we are finished with the stent graft, it looks like this with a gold marker sewn around it. We then take this sheath and using a combination of techniques, resheath the device reconstrain the top cap, and the device is ready for implantation. We then insert that into the patient through the femoral artery, and then partially deploy that graft, lining up those fenestrations with the visceral branch vessels. We then select the contralateral gate of the stent graft, go up and select with wires out into those branch vessels, and then place covered stents to seal the graft in place. On average, these operations take about an hour to manufacture the device and create the fenestrations. They take about two and a half hours to perform the entire procedure with about 45 minutes of fluoroscopy time, about 30 cc's of contrast, and about 200 cc's of estimated blood loss. I would be happy to discuss this new technology with you at your convenience. <music>